Hello and welcome to the next episode of The Podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. As always, this episode was brought to you by our amazing and fantastic sponsors. We're so incredibly appreciative of them. Please go check out their sites. Please go support them. When you buy from them, you support us because they support us. So without further ado, seeds here now. Best in the business. Guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. If you look at like Attitude and they're like, oh, we guarantee germination. It's like, what even is that for a promise? Like, of course it should fucking germinate. That's like not even a good level of quality service however guarantee on satisfaction how can you go wrong man that's the best you can get likewise radio ridge nursery best cuts in the game if you want to know where to get the best breed of cuts you don't have time to fino hunt you need that stacking killing kush right now hit them up they got everything you need from bodhi cuts to swamp boy cuts to fig farm cuts can't even get that shit anywhere it's hot it's fire it's so fire Likewise, a huge shout out, huge, huge shout out to the Patreon gang. These guys are literally the lifeblood of the show. If you are interested in getting more content of the show, please go check out the Patreon. You can help support the show, help make more episodes happen. And there's a whole bunch of stuff there waiting for you to get through right now. This episode, we are joined by the one and only Gage Green. We are incredibly lucky to have this interview. It's a big one. It's full of great information, juicy stories, and they really give a great recount of a whole variety of different things that have gone down over the years. Strap in for a two-parter, guys. Let's get into it. Alrighty, gang. A big thank you and welcome to the masterminds behind the hugely popular and infamous Gage Green Genetics. Jeff and Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm doing good, my friend. The first question we love to ask everyone, what are you guys smoking on today? Uh, we're smoking uh, Wedding Cake and Triangle Kush Grape Stomper Underdog. Yeah, and uh, some Cherry Pie Kush. Uh, just smoking from the premium stuff that we've set aside and just uh, enjoying our favorite flavors. Oh my gosh, I'm so jealous of all of those flavors. I guess my first question would be, how do you rate the cherry pie kush on its own as a flower? Oh, it's um, everything you could really look for and ask for. It has, uh, it's multidimensional, so it's not like uh, a single flavor. Um, it's everything we like about the cherry pie, the cookies, OG, chem, kind of all in one, I would say. And it's got the eye, you know, the bag appeal. It's got a lot of tri coverage. It's not small buds in any, by any means. I mean, like, obviously it's still cush, but it's not like what we're used to seeing with like, uh, cookies and stuff like that. And it's it's just a phenomenal plant to grow. So it's it's really a winner in all regards. Yeah, one of my favorites all time. Definitely heirloom, heirloom quality. It is the foundation and building block of a lot of our upcoming strains and things. We've been working with it for a long time, and it's just phenomenal to work with. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I've got a few questions about the cherry pie kush. I guess the most simplest one is, how does it differ from just the cherry pie? So, um, we've, the cherry pie has always been, well, I mean, I've seen a lot of different cherry pie. Let me just start with that. Like, I'm not really exactly sure once people say cherry pie, what they, uh, think is cherry pie because I've seen so many different varieties from, authentic sources and it just I think it's there's uh there's a few different strains that are being called the same but basically what I know it's to be is there's one that's really kind of like real waxy real GDP dominant and I would say that um cherry pie kush okay everybody knows I guess you would say the difference between a uh, cherry pie and and what what we call the cookies well, cherry pie kush, you could say, would fit probably right in the middle, except it seems to be like more likely that it could have been the predecessor 
to both because it seems less watered down, more complex, and it retains a lot of, um, it has a lot of like Kush heritage to it that's not really in cherry pie or cookies, if that makes sense. Like cherry pie Kush tastes like lemon gas. That's not what cherry pie or cookies taste like. So um, it was like really enjoyable because when you when you've smoked enough of like the original elite of the elite strains, then you kind of know like the original is usually more robust, more complex. Um, it grows better. It's just something about it. It's like this is the top dog, right? And that's what I get with the cherry pie Kush. So it's like I don't even desire cherry pie. I mean, it was all right. If I, if, you know what I mean? Cherry cookies is phenomenal, and it's definitely a worthy, you know. Um, successor, I guess you could say, to Cherry Pie Kush. It, they, they, they both really shine to me. Yeah, what a really nice kind of rundown on the two different ones. And I've always been interested because whenever we talk about cookies and cherry pie, everyone talks about how the buds distinctly start to get smaller. And you just mentioned the Cherry Pie Kush is bigger. It's, it's before that. What sort of genetics do you think were incorporated possibly with the cherry pie kush to start making the buds smaller and more towards that cookie type of expression? Um, there, I know that, you know, there was OG being bred into it and OG is not known to have large flowers. So that, so as you inbreed into the line looking for what your specific, you know, phenos and flavors you kind of lose that bigger or the original, you know, like everything, you know, like that's, that's why we like to go back to land race and like to keep things exotic because even you start inbreeding things. Yeah. You like that frost or the cookie density of color, but what else are you sacrificing chasing the dragon? If I may, you know, so it's like, um, cherry pie Kush was most likely creating, and it does create S one seeds s1 seeds produce s1 seeds and so the more you go into that kind of direction you're not talking about vigor you know what i'm saying and that's like there's room and, and that could be a reason why that the yields have completely disappeared but but see when you take uh, a low yielding cut like say the form cut and you cross it with something more exotic you're going to get that yield back i mean We've seen that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, undeniably. Uh, definitely in the Gage Green work, I've seen that as well. So, just as one last little follow-up to that, something which really resonated with me with what you just said a minute ago was talking about how the real elite is more robust and just better. This is maybe a bit of a no-brainer, but do you put TK in that category in regards to the OG and Cushes? It's right up there. I think I think um, cherry pie Kush it yields better, and um, I like the look of it. But um, triangle Kush is excellent. Yeah, this is what I'll say about a triangle Kush. I've seen it grown the same cut a million different ways, and as the cuts get older, I mean it's like you know how three 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 decades by by now at least, and so like it's. It's not the same. And so it takes a special kind of grower and a special touch to make it express the way it did when it was young. And I've seen it grown by a lot of different people and the same person can grow it really good. And, and, the, and another run, it just might not perform the same because it's so finicky, because it's lost a lot of that, that original vigor. But when grown properly, and grown to its full potential it's everything like we love about all the ogs um but then when it's not grown right it's like smoking cardboard so that's that's my perspective with triangle kush i've seen the same growers grow it in in all these different ways and so but i do think that uh triangle kush is one of the heirloom cuts that is still around today yeah what a really good answer and just to quickly jump back to something that Jeff said at the start, you said you were smoking on the, the Wedding Cake, Underdog, there was a few other things in there. Is that one of the upcoming releases? 
the uh, grape stump, the uh, Triangle Kush grape stumper underdog was something that um, I I was fooling around with about maybe nine months ago, and we grew the seeds out and sampling it. Uh, we had a we had um, one pretty good pheno off that that it's still I don't think it's good enough to keep. I like to explore our, our genetics all the time and see see how we're doing. So um, you know it, it's it's above average, but um, it's not it's not anything that is going to win a prize. I don't think, but um, it's enjoyable, and I'm sure that most of our our uh, friends and uh, Gay Green family would really like it, but. You know, once again, we're we're really looking for the very best, and um, to me, it's just back to the drawing board. Yeah, okay, that's it's so refreshing to hear a breeder speak about a project that maybe hasn't exactly worked out. Because I think a lot of breeders don't want to elude that there is a bit of trial and error in these things. How often do you go through stock? And because I mean, what I should say is, it also sounds like you've got a really high standard of quality, which is fantastic. Because you know, the week doesn't stay. How often do you find things that do make the cut? Well, whenever we whenever we do our own selections and we find worthy plants, we all we share it and we give it to friends and family. But in terms of like long lasting keepers, we we are always comparing to the best, uh, you know, in the industry. So. Uh, I would say like one in every hundred Venus is worth keeping. That's that's actually still a remarkably high percentage considering you're comparing it to like TK and Cherry Pie Kush. Right. And but because these because our genetics are line bred with the heirlooms of the past 30, 40 years. I would say that it makes the the success rate a little higher. I mean, it makes the uh, keeper ratio higher. And I though, and to be honest, like there's really good selections that we're getting rid of, but it's because we're looking for that longevity. Yeah, really good sentiment. So hopefully you don't mind, but let's take it all back to the start. And I think maybe Jeff might chime in on this one. How did Gage Green start? Uh, well, Gage Green started after my mentor, uh, after a uh, season of running uh, the gear that my mentor had given me um, just to fool around and breed with. And um, when, when, I, when we had... Um, Let's see, the first seeds I had um, out of that were the Mendo Montage and the Blackberry Pie. And he had given me Blackberry Widow. Um, the Mendo Perps was something that he was testing for somebody else. And he said, yeah, he, the guy who was running him said that he had IBL'd him. And I don't know, I just saw the genetics and they were they were magnificent. So I had to work with those. and. Um, after we, after those runs, um, that Jojo had given me, you know, it was just, I had put them out on a website with a, um, invitational website called MediUser. And it, this was, um, and I had given a lot of the users, um, seeds to try out and all I was getting was, um, really good result. I mean, really good feedback. So, um, when I had the opportunity to to go to uh, Harborside, I jumped on it. And when I had the opportunity to go to Attitude Seed Bank, I jumped on it. So I've always been – I've always promoted my gear because I know that it's really good just with friends. And people around me were always wanting it, even if they had to steal to get it. And that's just basically the way we started, you know? I mean, um, I just wanted to put them out to the world. I knew that it was, I knew that these 
genetics were special. And in like ways that I can't even explain, you know, it was just, it was just like somebody guiding me, you know, I didn't have to really try hard to do what I did. It just, it just happened. And of course, Jojo had given me a plethora of beautiful things and, and the attitude that I received from him, just like have fun. That was his whole thing. Just have fun doing it. And, um, and we did, we had a lot of fun. It was a lot of work though, you know? And so I hope that kind of answers your question. Yeah, definitely. A really good explanation. We, we'd gotten a few questions from our listeners and they were just interested in things like, how did you meet Jojo? And what were some of the things you guys were smoking back in that day that maybe you didn't create, but was just around? Um, I met Jojo through Craigslist ad. Actually, I had a um, I had a, a plant that he wanted, and uh, we met up. And the rest, I mean, we just became really good friends. We just started talking about all kinds of stuff. And he was the same age as as I was, and he had a very colorful background. I just basically listened to everything he said and and the guy had 30 plus years of straight experience just growing some of the dankest pot I've I've ever seen and one of his one of the strains that he was working on was called the uh, Hussein and the Hussein was um kind of like a um purple oracle cross but he was really excited about that. And another strain that he was really excited about, and he passed it on to me, which made the grape stopper was the, um, the purple, uh, elephant. And I'll tell you, these plants were the smelliest plants in veg as little ones. They would stink up the whole van. I mean, they were just incredibly stinky. And the guy just, he just always had the very best. He was fooling around with sativas, ruderalis, uh, indicas, um, just automatic uh, auto flowering. Just, it was a real, it, I mean, he wasn't here that long and I didn't know him that long, but man, I got a really good education with that guy just because I listened to him, you know, and, and every word he said, I listened to him. And everything he asked me to do, I did. So, you know, like he wanted me to hit all the purples he had given given me. With He didn't say with what. He just said have fun with it. So I was like a, I was like a guy with a, a box of paints who wanted to go paint everything. You know, I just, I just did every, everything I could and knew that I was going to have a gold mine the year after so it was it was a just a really lovely experience yeah that sounds like a really good platform to launch things from we had a question from another fan who was wondering if you could explain the difference between the purple elephant and the grape stomper i think they maybe thought they might have been the same okay well the purple elephant uh was the mother used to make the grape stomper and the purple elephant was hit with um, with a very frosty male, um, and the grape stomper was one of one of about um, probably 50, 50 progenies that that I tested um, when I had those seeds, and the grape stomper was the only thing worth keeping out of that. So we just kind of talked about that. Every all the other things were just like second rate. All all of her uh, sisters and um, I kept quite a few brothers and and I I bred with quite a few. But as far as the grape stomper was was miles um, ahead of the anything else the siblings were doing. It was just incredible. And don't think I didn't try looking for you know. Um, things that were right in on that level. It, it just, it just was a gift. 
I just call it a gift that that appeared. And that was one of the ones too that that really got picked up by a lot of people. A lot of people realized that this was going to be an important strain and um you know, they couldn't help their their uh sticky little fingers, but you know, regardless um it's just an excellent excellent uh strain and and the way it came about was just almost like um almost like a beautiful gift is what i keep saying yeah of course so i think an interesting point you kind of mentioned there was the hussein is that still around by any chance I have no idea because Joe passed in 08, so I have no idea. And I really wasn't um, – a lot of his the friends that he had at that time, they didn't even – he never spoke of me. So I didn't I – don't, I don't even know who what crowd he was running with, and I've never been able to compare notes. Um, I, I've never heard of it, to tell you the truth, out there. Yeah, sure. So you mentioned a few times that, unfortunately, you've had some people steal some stuff from you. And I listened to another interview on the Growcast you did. And I think, Michael, you said the person's name was The Collector. Have you guys been able to figure out anything more about that and who that person is at all? Oh, yeah, we know who that person is. You know, it's just... um you know, he's just an individual that that is, you know, a dishonest individual who who's probably hurting really bad right now because he knows that, you know, I, I, I love to help people. I really do. But a lot of people, they they just kind of take that for granted and they get greedy and they corrupt themselves and. It's, it's something that I think that people, when they're young, they don't think about what their future is going to be like after doing things like that. But, you know, um, I guess, uh, you know, and maybe it's partly me to blame for being so, so trusting and kind. And I don't know. I, don't, I really don't want to get into the, um, you know, punching somebody's name out there or whatever because they know who they are. But, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure most every, um, grower has, has been through things like this themselves, you know, with just people in this industry thinking they, you know, they're going to pull a fast one, you know? Yeah. So anyways. Okay. That's, yeah, I totally understand that. I actually wasn't aware you guys knew who it was, but there you go. So, some stuff I read online said that after you had stuff stolen, it kind of showed up at Oaksterdam and it was renamed. And then another story I read said that it didn't show up at Oaksterdam, it showed up at Blue Sky Collective. Were they the same thing or was one of these stories not quite correct? What what actually happened there? Yeah, Oaksterdam is a section of Oakland where all the clubs are. And um, Blue Sky, or um, uh, there was another uh, name for it, Stealth. Bulldog. Yeah, Bulldog and Stealth. They, uh, they kept changing up. It was like a little cafe yeah. style, kind of like in Amsterdam. Right. Like, and they had, um, I mean, they were, this place was really doing a lot of, I mean, there would be lines around the block, you know, on, on Monday mornings to pick up clones. So um, the person that um, that uh, took the cut uh, was friends and thought that he would get an in with with the Oaksterdam crowd because that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to um, secure his future in the cannabis industry by, you know, just meeting and and impressing people. So he took it there. And um, he took the first tray there and and renames it Sour Grapes. And it's funny because Sour Grapes is is actually an apothecary name. Bog Seeds also has a, a Sour Grapes as well. Right. So it wasn't, you know, once again, there's no real um, there's re- no real creativity here. 
you know, the one number one guy takes uh, somebody else's work and then renames it with somebody else's name. So it's kind of like I don't even hear it called that anymore. So and I don't even know what happened to the people. He, he's probably in the porn industry or something, you know, that's what a lot of these these guys, they just have this um, they just have this um, this kind of mindset, you know, that they're just out to use and abuse. And that's the whole thing. And that's not what, what we're about. You know, we want we want to do really good things and. We believe that there's a life behind every plant that we grow and every every creation that we have, and and um, we want to give people success. But but man, you know, don't don't tear us down and tear yourself down trying to you know get it because you know life's too short and there's there's enough things to be creative creative with. You know, everybody can can be creative, you know, just just be honest about it. So, yeah, that's um, that's that's kind of what happened. And um, it was a lesson learned life lesson. One of many. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. well, just to give Jeff a little chance to chat, I always wanted to know what were the types of things you were smoking growing up? Um, well, smoked a lot of Mexican pot, smoked a lot of Colombian, um, gold. And that was like my favorite, um, because that was really heady. That was just really like the kind of stuff you want to hide from people when you smoke, you know, maybe it was at that time, but it it was good pot the the Colombians and, and the Panamas were good pot and um um panama red um and let's see what else did we have some thai stick i had a friend who who had been in vietnam so we were smoking uh, a couple vietnam uh vietnamese joints uh on friday nights when i was in high school and between four of us and that was really a, a great experience and then when I was a little older, we were smoking uh, um, blonde and red Lebanese hash. Um, I actually joined the army to, to go to Europe to, to find the best hash because I had a friend who had been there. And and in just his story, just, I, I, I said, well, I can get there if I join the army. And that's what I did. So um, and the, the hash was phenomenal. I'd never had anything like it. It was cheap. It was um, plentiful, and it was all wrapped in canvas with wax seals on it. When you bought in bulk, it was just—it was an incredible experience, you know. And now today, when I look back on it, you know, it, it the hash these days is so much stronger and cleaner, and uh, it just it's so much better but i'll tell you we were we were so excited back then to have what we had and so grateful to have what we had it was we thought that we were we were king of the world you know yeah wow and i don't suppose you saved any seeds at all uh i saved a lot of seeds but man i've moved all over all my life and been ups and downs and to tell you the truth none of the seeds got saved yeah, no, that's understandable. I think a lot of people have that kind of feeling looking back on some of their earlier days. So, on the other hand, Michael, how about you? What was some of the weeds you were smoking on when you were growing up? Uh, well, I was just I was just uh, saying, like when when I was a kid. I mean, I wasn't. I'm I'm only, I'm thirty, so I haven't been around for that long, like Jeff. But thanks. I was. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in Southern California, so we smoked OG, Bubba, and Master. And that was like pretty much what I grew up on. And say like in the Southern California area, there were a few like more sativa heirlooms going around, like Afghan Bull Rider. There was always the Jack. There was, you know, always um, 
just a few few exotics but i'll be but i'll be honest it was always kush that was like what we were looking for and um there's like 100 200 different types of ogs that we used to move and it was that was that was my focus back in the day was really just getting the the gaseous and and cushiest kush i could get Wow. So what's the most memorable one you can bring to mind? Uh, well, I will say, so like, you know, when, when we were, when I was younger, like we didn't, it wasn't like as distinct, like this was this, or this was that we were just whatever we could get our hands on. But I was just telling the story about, um, sour diesel being like the first strain that actually had a name. It was, um, we were smoking it and, and it was, it, it just hit different. And like, that was the moment where I was like, what was that? And somebody was like, that was sour diesel. And that, I mean, it, it might've been my first time real, realizing it, but I was like, oh shit, weed has names. Like there's different names to this stuff. And where can we get some more of this sour D stuff? And the reason why I bring, I brought it up was the, because uh, we just got the sour diesel clone, or uh, yeah, the, the sour D and the East Coast sour diesel. So we've been playing with that and smoking it. It really just brings me back. And um, so sour D was also like obviously a favorite. But that was just a moment where I was like, wow, there's distinct differences in cannabis. Before we, when we were younger, it was like this is just let's just get some chronic, and it was all the same. And I don't know where this where this weed was coming from, but it was trash. And, um, one day we just got better. <laughs> and then after it's like, just like, you know, where can we get the, where can we get the cush? And, um, that's, that's all, that's what we sold. That's what I, that's what I sold growing up was OG Bubba and, uh, you know, different types of cush master. Like I was saying, I am very jealous, seeing as those are some of my most favorite strains. I guess what I'm interested in is, was there for you a kind of defining moment that solidified to you that you wanted to breed or that you wanted to spend your life working with the plant? So, I'll, so a little bit about my, for me, like I didn't really have the knowledge about breeding until I met Jeff. And I mean, like he was he's obviously the, the one to, to learn it from. But the way I was introduced to cannabis was I've just always sold weed. Like to me, it was like, a, it, to me, it was, it was my lifestyle. I didn't know why I, I was like so passionate and, uh, with this plant, but I was getting arrested and kicked out of school for it and I couldn't not do it. And, um, it obviously caused a lot of familial tension and, as, you know, with and also cops and schools and whatever. But I ended up still graduating high school and ended up going to Berkeley, where I continued to sell weed. And one of the guys that I met while I was going to Cal was this guy named um, Ed or Ahmed, and uh, he was a really cool guy, a stoner that had a medical card. And he's like, Mike, you should get a medical card. Well, I got a, when I got a medical card, this is like when I was 18, I started going to dispensaries. And most people know, like, you know, when you go to dispensaries, you see all different strains. And it's like, it's very eye opening, especially in the Bay Area. And I started to just get the, you know, I was always getting the best weed I could. Ed said, hey, you should um, meet this guy known, uh, what do you call you? Back? Oh, Al. Yeah. And so like, so, so Jeff or key place name back then was Al. It's like all I knew him by. That's all he, everyone called him was Al. Alamoda. Yeah. That was his, like, one of his handles. <laughs> and so Al was, um, was a grower. And so I met Al one day in Berkeley and you know, he, he was like what, for a quarter pound or something like that. And I was like, Holy fuck, this weed is just phenomenal. It was like grape stomper, you know, type stuff. Uh, and I had been to all the clubs. I had in LA and the Bay Area and bought all the top shelf buds and never had ever seen wheat like this. And so from that day forward, I was like, I sold his weed at school. 
and mm. uh, a lot of it. And so we built a relationship. And I, at that time, I just knew there was this guy was growing a lot of different kinds of weed. I didn't know he was making them. And uh, so then one day I was just like, um, dude, we should like. And you know, I, we, he he would let me sample stuff, and I'd give him give him my my opinions on it, and I I'd sell the fuck out of it. But like, when I um w- one day actually like what happened was I got I got busted by an undercover at school, and that ended my like my my run. You know, like I was selling weed to everybody, and then it was like uh, what was it? Oh, and then so I was like, fuck, I'm not I I'm not getting like I gotta just focus on weed now because what what I was doing before was I was looking for internships I was looking for job opportunities and really trying to go the whole college route build a successful career in finance or whatever it was and that wasn't really uh obviously wasn't going to work out for me and I was like you know like fuck working for somebody that doesn't appreciate what you love Fuck working for somebody that's not going to hire you just be, or trying to work for somebody that doesn't want to hire you because you like to smoke weed. Or that. So ultimately, I was like, like you know, I'm going to focus on cannabis. So I reached out to Jeff and I was like, hey, let's combine my entrepreneurial skills with whatever you got going on, which is like all this crazy cannabis grown organically. That's, you know, that's the best weed in the world. And let's make a brand that that represents what you are all about. And so I think it was in 2009 when this all happened. And then like we started it, we, we put up, I think that was around when Attitude picked you up same, around the same time. And we built a website and a, a forum community, which is where a lot of our um, friends and members of Gage Green that really originated from. And that's really where it took off. So that's really where I be, kind of joined the whole breeding side of things and, and learned everything I could from key play who's an amazing teacher and then opened this world up to me. Yeah. Well, actually I had asked him if he wanted to ever wanted a job that, you know, um, you know, I, I'd be willing to, um, try him out when he was still, you know, dealing the, the weed that I was, and then, and then he got busted and, 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 because he got busted, he was never going to work in the banking system again. <laughs> so I said, so I was going like, to work in any system again, like for real, though. Right. He was interning at Sony of all places, fucking Sony music and shit. And it was like a part of me was saying, dude, I got to get this guy out of here. So it just came together. You know, I mean, it was like. It was just something that was meant to be, you know, and the journey really began, you know, and we've had, you know, we've had a lot of ups and downs, you know, um, working together and stuff. And, you know, we've had to reevaluate our whole our whole existence here with Gage. But, you know, I would say that um, the Gage Green is is stronger than it's ever been and more focused on where we're going. You know, back then we really, I knew that, I knew we had the potential to be really, really solid, you know, and, and all I wanted to do was really make, to make really good products, to make quality seeds and grow quality pot. And I always figured if I could do that, then I know I'll get my customer base. So that began, but Mike he has a lot of ideas that, and he sees a lot of things that I don't with, with the marketing and and everything. So what I'm trying to say here is uh, I think we complement each other a lot. Um, we don't always see eye to eye, but I think that's a good thing. You know, it's a healthy thing. And, um, and I think we're stronger than we've ever been here. One thing that we like to, we, we, what I think is the reason why we're a real strong team is because when we first like, well, we use different parts of our brain and that's one of the reasons why we don't always see eye to eye because we have uh, differing perspectives on everything. So we see different, see the same object object from two different perspectives. And what that allows us to do is present something whole to our audience because 
It's like he's got the right brain, I got the left brain. And so what Gage Green is, is it's kind of like this union of like this kind of a artistic approach with the scholastic approach with uh, creativity from all sides and, and artistry from, you know, two, two people that want to just create the best art. Yeah, totally. I can, I can actually really see that now that you've kind of articulated it. You mentioned a really interesting point about how when you guys kind of started to pair up around that 2009 period, that was uh, around the time when you guys got in with Attitude. I remember that was when I first became aware of Gage Green was I saw you guys on Attitude. But I was interested to know, you were already in Harborside. How did the demand initially pan out in terms of domestic versus international? Was it mostly like the international wasn't so familiar with you, so you were kind of cracking into it, or was there always an interest from the start? Um, I think that there was an interest in anybody who, okay, with attitude, I I presented myself uh, professionally, and I think... I believe that that captured the attention. We were not international. We were not working in um, to the degree that we're working. We weren't where we're at now at all. We were starting off. So, um, but soon being with Attitude uh, and Mike joining forces, we started selling everything out at Attitude. Uh, what it is is it's internet marketing. It's not it, it almost like there is no difference between domestic and international when you are when you have a foundation on the internet. And the community of cannabis on the internet is international, and it almost like so when you present a new idea all over the world, and that's really what happened with Gage. We had. We had a forum where we had people from the UK, from Australia, from uh, South America, you know, and locally. So when we had dropped the Leia OG seeds without doing much uh, awareness locally, we just did it online. There we had people waiting in line at the dispensary, and that was like our the first realization, like, oh, this is this actually gets is getting attention, and so yeah, it almost ha- happened like at the same time, but I know Jeff uh, had put a lot of work in for years locally, selling clones, selling seeds uh, at the dispensaries. And so he put, he did set a lot of groundwork that I, I, that was originally started in the Bay area. Right. Yeah. I was all over the Bay area, San Francisco, East Bay, South Bay, North Bay, all the way from Napa to San Jose to, you know, big area with a lot of growers and a lot of good California growers. So there was a lot of stuff happening. It was really exciting when, you know, in around 2008, 2009, 2010, it was really a lot happening. So... No, certainly. I remember that when I first saw you guys on Attitude, the Joseph OG crosses were like all the rage. Would you be able to give us a little bit of a backstory on how you found that mail? I know that there's a bit of an interesting twist on it. Well, the the mail was found um, from underdog bag sheet and um, we knew that that cut right away was was the cut and... It really was. You know, we we got that in uh, 08, I believe it, 2008. Right before Mike uh, joined forces, we had that. Um, so, yeah, that uh, we had that cut for, what, 10 years? Uh, not eight years? Like uh, yeah, until... until Till we were in Willits and we... Yeah, somebody who was watching our garden just decide they didn't want to watch it that closely anymore yeah this person has has the audacity to still talk about us but anyways that's besides the point yeah so anyways but joseph was um phenomenal you know phenomenal um and put a lot of work out yeah 
I, I've seen the crosses. They're phenomenal. And something I was always interested in was given you've seen the results of it grow now and you know that the mum was underdog. Do you have any idea about what the male might have been that made the Joseph OG? Uh, I have no idea what it was, but it's definitely something really gassy. It's a good question. Like it's, it's most likely something from your garden uh, that, that pollinated because it's a male, so it's not an S1 and it's not a Hermie. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it has, yeah. definitely puts out seeds, you know? Right, yeah. right. It's, a, it's an authentic male. Yeah. We utilized him as much as we could. Like, uh, um, you know, I just – I used him in whole rooms of big plants and just going crazy, which is – Something we don't do these days, I mean, you know, picking up something like 50,000 seeds off a plant, you know, we definitely don't do those kind of numbers like that anymore. But we wanted to get every everything we could from that from that mail. It was like my flagship mail at the time and um, served served us well. Yeah, for sure. So I wanted to go back for just a moment. I forgot to ask. You said that in those early days, maybe a little even, no, it was probably about around the time of the Joseph OG, you said that you guys were working with like these really nice OGs, nice chems, nice purples. In your opinion, what's the best OG? What's the best chem and what's the best purple? Hmm. Okay, well, the best purple to me is purple elephant. That's the best purple I've worked with. Has everything: looks, uh, smell, um, weight, uh, everything. Uh, maybe Mike could could um, elaborate on the best OG that we worked with. What do you think? Um, I like them all. The Triangle Kush, the '92, the King Louis, Tahoe—they're all unique to me. I like them. I just, I like OG. And then, um, Chem, we, we, we've worked with the Chem 91 and the Chem D. I'd say those two are probably the ones to go with. Yeah. I love the Chem D. That was really, um, I love growing that plant. It's just some of the, so many memories of just growing and smoking that stuff and just, man, what a massive plant. Um, just everything about it was just beautiful. And I'm just so grateful to have crossed it with the things that we did, you know. So what a prolific girl, you know. Yeah, definitely. And, I mean, just because the Chem Dog's a bit of a fan favorite on the show, do you intend to do any crosses with, say, the Chem D or the Chem 91 just as, like, F1s going forward or? Um... When the time is right, we'll get it back. I I would definitely want to go back into it and and um, play with it some more. But right now we have a lot of other things that we're doing. Um, so we we always have plenty of things going, uh, great things going. And when the time is right, it'll come back to us. That's what I always like to say. Yeah, we don't do a lot of we don't go we don't say like hey we have to get this clone we're gonna do everything we can to get it it's more like the universe has always seemed it's always seemed to guide us to the right genetics and we make seeds from this the genetics that we are growing and and smoking and selling our own ourselves so it's always curated for the time and the place and so like you know for example after we after we had to restart, we we started with all new genetics. We had some from local, some from our friends, and we basically put together our best collection that we could with what we had. And that's always what we've done. And um, so instead of just like going down the line and hitting all our favorite clone onlys, <clears throat> onlys we it's it's vari- it's a variety and it's always different. And there's no you know set rule or method or or pattern to how we work we just it's more free free flow and and uh we let the universe guide us i guess you could say 
Yeah, of course. And I mean, no denying you guys have got a range of different projects to pursue. I guess I'm interested, what's the first mail you guys kind of worked together on? Was it the Grape Stomper OG? Uh, the Grape Stomper OG was the OG Joe and the Grape Stomper, and we did that. Um, Mike was with us when we did that, yeah. Yeah, we. Um, some of the first projects were like the Grape Stomper back crosses that we did and the Grape Stomper OGs, uh, the, you know, and a lot of the Chem Dog crosses, the Daybreaker. Those are amongst the first few you know, projects that I, was, that I had a hand in. Um, when I first joined... Jeff had a, a line of seeds that he had already been working with. So like um, some of those names, I guess, could were like, there was like the L.A. Hayes, the, the Pepe Le Dank, the Pepe Le Cam, the Mendo Montage, I believe. Um, Blackberry Pie. Right, Blackberry Pie. Yeah. These are some of the, the, the original seeds that he had been already branded as Gage Green. And then I um, started selling those you know or marketing those along with the new things that were coming out with the g13 skunk mail that i had uh picked up from some seed from mr nice that was really it was really nice and um i was really excited about those crosses i hit it with the chem d and i hit it with a um a few other things it was just it was just kind of like my foray into working with something that had been established by a master breeder, Shanti Baba, who I really look up to. Uh, the guy has really done so much incredible work in, within this industry and really is, I mean, without the guy, I don't, I don't know if Gage Green would be here. You know I mean? He just, I mean, he created the White Widow. He created a lot of things, and he's just a nice human being. So I was really excited about this, and um, <clears throat> I don't think that, to tell you the truth, I don't think those seeds we did uh, were on the level as some of our uh, more prolific crosses, but they had a lot of good intention behind them, and um, and it, it it's kind of nice just to reminisce. But um, another another male we worked with was a crystal locomotive male, um, which was um, that made up the uh, Mendo Montage uh, and the Blackberry Pie. Um, so we just had a lot of the the crystal locomotive is a um, train wreck, a little white widow. And um, it, and Joe had gone to Amsterdam to get the Hello White Widow from a from a guy who had a shop there, and um, so he and he brought a pack of seeds back, and he had a male uh, and a female it was called Sweet Thing, and um, uh, of course Joe did all these uh, wonderful crosses and and. Um, gave me buku seeds and starts and and um but that's that's what uh really com comprised a lot of the gauge uh, early gauge stuff yeah fantastic at this point i'm wondering if you guys have a copy of my questions in front of you because you're just ticking them all off um <laughs> i wanted to ask a little bit about the aloha white widow actually like is it i i i might be just need to do more research but is it just like a really special cut of a white widow or is there some hawaiian in it uh no there was a um i don't really know the whole story there's a shop in amsterdam called the loa seeds and a lot of these um, dutch cats um you know i guess they had been working with with or in a Shanti Baba project and few seed banks in the Netherlands that, that grabbed the uh, a, a white widow cut. And this particular individual um, created what he called the Aloha white widow and, um, and he became infamous for it. And Joe was always online at um, both open grow and heavens heavens stair uh stairway i think it was 
uh, these old, these two old uh, sites, and he he knew just what the world was putting out. And if he wanted it bad enough, he would just go get it or, you know, procure it one way or another. So um, although the guy, you know, it's, it's kind of misleading because it's, it's the same name, White Widow. But what I think is that it's something that he created from a White Widow cross and, and just name, you know, because he had worked with, with it, he, he started a seed bank uh, and their specialty was the Aloha White Widow. Yeah, good story, good story. And you mentioned um, just a minute ago the crystal locomotive from Joe and whatnot. I was interested if you could give us a rundown on that because it's pretty mythical. And as a follow-up, have you noticed train wrecks making a bit of a comeback? Well, good luck finding the original. You know, we talk about how genetics get kind of watered down and beat up and everything. And, you know, um, the train wreck I had, I know I had the original back in, Oh seven, it was called the E32 cut right out of Arcata, and there was nothing like it uh, that I, you know, it was. It's kind of like a strange hive, really speedy, really racy, really peppery smell, and it doesn't last that long. And it was some of the frostiest pot I've ever seen or even grow i was getting four hundred dollars an ounce back in 07 and um which is incredible but you know it's it's strange because the high would only last like 20 i mean really onslaught heavy high for like 20 or 30 minutes and so you know but there's just something about it people just wanted that you know, and I don't know if we found the original, I'd love to work with it. Um, but I don't, I don't really know. That's going to be a real challenge trying to find the original, you know, someone's got it. Yeah. Somebody's got to have it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. We, we hear a lot of people discuss whether the real exists, where to get it. Um, a buddy of the show, Mr. Bob Hempill, I think he might have it or probably the closest to it if anyone does. But just as a follow up, what was the crystal locomotive like compared to the train wreck? Like more racy, less racy? Uh, with the White Widow, the flavor, um, the flavor wasn't as peppery and or spicy. Um, there was... The crystal locomotive itself had a little bit of color, a little bit of lavender in it, but the the frost was just incredible, really super incredible. It was like you can see where the grape stomper was was made um, just by looking at the uh, crystal locomotive, the frost on it. Yeah, of course, of course. And you did touch on how you use some Mr. Nice genetics. I remember that mostly for the Inferno Haze. I remember I grabbed a pack of that and that has the Afghan Haze in it. Did you go through a few different Mr. Nice lines? And do you feel like Amsterdam genetics fell off at any point? Well, yeah, I mean, I've heard rumors most of the big breeders in Amsterdam use Spanish breeders and so they're subbing their work out now I'm pretty sure that there's some truth in that I've bought seeds from some of these breeders and I've been really disappointed um, not with the Mr. Nice stuff um, but with a lot of the other stuff so yeah I think it's fallen off I really do yeah. Oh well, it's a bit of a bit of a downfall, but that's okay. The, I I think it's interesting, and it prompted the question about the attitude compared to Oxidam thing in the past, because I think around 2010 was where the European guys really started to realize that the USA genetics were better. Did you notice that at all? Well, I've always believed that um, that USA genetics are are I mean, Cali genetics were better. I've had the privilege to meet people that n are never online and, you know, and nobody knows. I never, I didn't know who they were before, but their, their work was just some of the most phenomenal work and it's just their life's calling. That's what they do. And 
there's no hype about it. It's just, it's just the best, the best of the best. Um, but I have to say that I know that Michigan is a top uh, cannabis uh, contender in the world. So Michigan now is really there's so many good uh, growers here and so many people that really know it's a, it's almost like um, it's almost like being in Cali ten years ago. You know, with the excitement now, everybody in Cali is like trying to grow as big as they can, and you know, it's just kind of crazy. Um, there's a lot of excitement here in Michigan. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, maybe a, a a good time to chat about it. Are there any other breeders in Michigan you would want to consider working with, or do you guys just have your head in your own stuff too much at the moment? Um, I believe that we. How many are there? Well, I guess that's a part of the question, right? <laughs> like off the top, we focus so much on our own that we don't really even know what's going on a lot of times in in certain parts of the industry you know what i mean like so who who's here uh well you got um wasn't dj short here at one point yeah dj short is here now i believe and um we have we have some new people that really want to work with us yeah like there's leaf doctor and um there's a couple other people that are really good a bit of you know, champions. I consider these guys like champions. Yeah, Leaf so. Doctor would be definitely somebody that um, we've spoken about doing collaborations with. Right. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. We, and there's, you know, there's some people, um, you know, outside of Michigan that uh, we'll probably be doing some work with now, um, too. So, um, yeah, we got a lot of collaborations coming up. Not so much directly with um, breeders in Michigan. Uh but we've we've worked with other breeders in Michigan in the past, and yeah, there's a yeah. lot of good things going on. Like I don't really know about like like large big name breeders, but a lot of people that are just making their own crosses, and you know, like we, we share genetics with, and a lot of people incredible work like on the small scale, and so we kind of like we've kind of helped uh, and received help from a lot of just like I would say more independent like caregivers who are doing incredible work on their own and have really lifted us up in the last few years just making Gage Green even better and so yeah we've like we've kind of been planting seeds and spreading seeds and spreading genetics in the local Michigan area and have received a lot of really good things back in return so that's been really cool yeah that's really awesome to hear I was interested, what are the dispensaries like in Michigan? Because we had one uh, listener ask the question saying that, I think they said they're in Michigan as well, but they said they went to a dispensary and they got some grape stomper thinking, great, this will be a good chance. And it really kind of let them down. And so I was wondering, do you know if there are a lot of kind of imitation grape stomper cuts out there and what's the dispensary scene like in Michigan? Well, most of them are pretty bad, to tell you the truth. Um and you do have to be aware of imitations. Number one, always always go for the organic pot because you don't know what you know. And that's not a, that's very hard to find in a in a recreational or medical licensed dispensary. So that's why we don't go. Um, none of that cannabis is is even close to being up to par to what I would even want opened in my house. You know, let alone in my lungs. So. If that yeah. answers your question, yeah, anybody can grow a grape stomper. Most likely, that's not even grape stomper because authenticity is not there. Who are they? And do they know us? Do they really have the right seeds or are they just using the name? And that happens a lot. So, um, yeah, it's it's very difficult to find the authentic and authentic cannabis that's also good for you. That's why it's good to know a grower or to start growing yourself because – Dispensaries are are horrible. Yeah. No offense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. I, I think that's the same for Cali as well, even in my experience. Um, so, in terms of the, your catalog of work, it, it's it's undeniably extensive to say the least. 
how do you guys make all these strains? Like, you know, what what sort of lines do you think of? Because I, I have to think that some of these lines were really good and maybe they just, you, you could only dedicate yourself to so many things. So, they had to take a bit of a back seat. You know, what lines have you made that you think haven't quite got the attention they deserve? Hmm. That is a really, really good question. Huh. But to tell you the truth, there's there's a few of them, you know, and it's um, and it's partly because I I just haven't been able to explore everything. It's like a space limitation type thing, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, we have plant numbers, you know, um, you know, we have you know all kinds of well, I wouldn't. I don't really. I mean, I'm supposed to have limitations, but I'm not going to say that I'm limited so I can't do my job. But to tell you the truth, there's a lot of things that um, you mentioned. One, ways. I would have wanted to explore things like that because I love the sativas a lot. And I just think that that was really um, – those were some special projects. Yeah, Jeff is all about sativa, so if he could grow all – all the sativas in the world, he would, but, um, but, <laughs> but Mike is about OG, so I kind of have to. <laughs> no, it's more and like I love OGs. We got, I really do. The the garden has to pay for itself, and like um, sativas take too long to grow, and they just don't really, yeah, you know, produce the. It's like a lot. It's very experimental when you kind of delve into the land races and sativas. It's a lot of trial and error. Yeah, of course. And just as a side note, Jeff, I I totally vibe with that, man. Sativa's all the way. (laughs) Um, Well, good. I mean, we're on the same page. When you come visit us, I'll have a lot of sativas for you. Oh, man, you're too kind. You're too kind. And it brings up an interesting point that you guys have worked with a notably decent range of land races. I remember way back I grabbed a pack of the, I think they were called the Black Columbian. I think I remember it's called the Bastard Line or something like that. Do you guys plan to work more with these types of raw land race lines? Well, yeah, I'd really love to do that. Um, (coughs) Right now we're working with some, some Thai crosses and Malawi crosses, but I'm going to be picking up some other things that, um, you know, just like, um, both Indica and, uh, Sativa and yeah, we, I'll, I'll always be doing things like that. Yeah, that's awesome. I guess we can get to our first like semi-controversial hairy question. I remember a while back, Matt Riot said that you released those bastard lines out of spite or something about like other people had those seeds or whatever. Did you want to do a reply to that? Well, I don't, I don't really know um, what Matt Riot is talking about half the time because He's got so many lies going that I don't think he's able to remember them. And, you know, it's really sad because um, at one at one time, Matt Riot and I were 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 we were like friends, um, Internet friends. Mm -hmm. The problem with an Internet friend is you don't know what that person really is. So. You know, it's. It's difficult, and I don't think about the guy too much. I know that he bashes me every chance he gets, but I don't really like to give um, anybody the the spotlight. You know, I don't think he deserves it. And um, but I will clarify some things um, that most of everything that um, Matt Riot has um, projected is is just really horrible lies you know and um you know it's sad man because um some of the things are kind of vile and you know it's just too it's just too uh stupid to even get angry about you know it's like <clears throat> it's almost embarrassing and uh cringeworthy to hear him talk and i think i mentioned that to you in an email Because I did hear his, um, I did hear that interview you guys had and it was like, I was, I was thinking to myself and I think I told you, it's like, dude, if you like, if you have people like this on that are clearly, 
violating the truth, it's going to look bad for, I mean, I was thinking that it could look bad for you, you know, but I think that, I think you could do a lot better with quality people on your show than that. Really? Yeah, I, I can certainly understand the sentiment you're getting across and something I always like to let everyone, including the fans, know is that I always want to give everybody a, a right of reply, which is kind of the journalistic term, so that if someone ever said something and you thought it was egregious or totally incorrect, like you're more than welcome to come on the show and clear that up because, um, yeah, I agree. Like if someone were to be spreading lies, like that's you, you'd want to be able to do something or at least share your side of the story to counter that. Um, and you know, I, it kind of does make me cringe to bring it up, but we had so many people ask about it. There's just this prevalent kind of vile rumor that you were somehow involved in JoJo's passing or were around in that time. I'm sure you've heard of this. Is there any comment you'd like to make about that? And if you don't, I understand. Well, yeah, I mean, that's just the most ridiculous thing. Only a vile, um, low vibrational being would come up with something like that. I mean, well, let's just clear the table here like it comes from matt who lives in san diego which is like 10 hours away from all this and he's like the the he's like this online head so how, like how is he even he's not even tapped into like anything related like he doesn't how would he he doesn't even know yeah i mean the the guy is in la la land he think he thinks that he had the great stomper and he had the sour grapes you know, and he bought it from a club and it wasn't even authentic. And he built a whole, he bought a, he, he built like, um, a whole group of seeds with selling them for outrageous prices of things that wouldn't even pop. Uh -huh. I know the guy's story. He breeds on his, under a four by eight sheet of plywood in his living room with fluorescent lights under it in the coffee cup. So he gets like maybe 20 seeds. That's his thing. You know, he's told me all this, but, you know, dude, I, you know, different strokes from different folks. I just think the guy is like a, a very, very sad individual, you know, and it's just uh, crazy. So, you know, up until now for the, you know, you're the first person I've ever talked to this besides my partner and, and people that I know, my friends who all know that this guy is whacked out. You know, he's he's whacked out. He was whacked out on uh, on um, on heroin, and then it went to uh, the crap methadone. Methadone. He was, you know, what a what a horrible drug. You know, so I kind of I feel bad for the guy to tell you the truth, man. I really do, and I don't. You know, I just wish that he would get his shit together. You know, and 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 then maybe apologize and try to reinstate his life, you know, because, <clears throat> you know, bashing me isn't going to bring you happiness, dude. It's really not. I'm not your problem. You're your problem. You know, I never did anything to you and I never did anything to my partner, you know, my, my mentor. I mean, that's, that's the craziest shit. Um, Joe, Joe, um, died in and I spoke with his wife about it he's passed um, in less than 12 hours after after he was really he was rasping and and he just was a, had been a for a long time and that's what happened he should never been doing the things that he did he killed himself that's how Joe died that you know for me to do anything to him is one of the most ridiculous things I can even think of. You know, what, I I killed him for his genetics? That, that's one of the most stupid fucking things I ever heard. How could I do that? You know, how? Just how did I do that? So if if they have a way that I did that, I'd be, I'd be really interested to know because the story could, should get deep. Yeah, well, I... I, I I agree with pretty much most things you said there. I think, just so you're aware, the, the story that has always been told to me was that you traded him heroin or something to that effect. Absolutely not. I never, I never did any heroin in California. Never. 
and I was in California from, <clears throat> let me see, 1984 to um, 2017. Um, you know, no, I didn't, I wouldn't have done anything like that to Joe. I mean, and most people that know me know that I am anti, I've always been anti hard drugs. You know, that's, that's like putting the devil in your veins. You know, so is alcohol. That's my, that's my perfect personal, um, uh, that's where I make a stand against, you know, things that will make you a horrible person. You know, you drink, you do drugs, like, you know, bad drugs, and you're putting some bad shit into your body and your spirit, you know, and I would have never done that to anybody. So it, it really um, shows me how sick uh, the person is, you know, to even make something like that up, you know. Yeah, I understand, and, and I'm really sorry to, like, bring that up if it kind of brings up any bad memories of your friend, and I think the one thing we can certainly all agree on is that, you know, opioids are kind of the devil and have a really bad effect on everyone, included it, that we've been talking about. Right. Yeah, I mean, the methadone is even worse, you know. The methadone will break down your body and turn you into a, uh, a emotional basket case. So I realize people have problems, dude. And I realize that a lot of people probably wanted to hear this story. So, you know, you don't have to apologize. I, you know, I'm, I'm answering it because, you know, we can clear it up right here, you know, and, and, uh, and move on, you know, but. If we we could get a pic, it would be, if we could get a clear face shot of Matt Riot and just ask people to make the decision, is it, Likely, more likely that this guy Jeff, who is uh, pretty much not harmed a single being and can't even eat meat, is it more likely that he killed his friends for his genetics, or is it possibly more likely that this guy who, let's just, I, I don't even want to describe what the face shot would look like, but let's just say this guy, Matt Wright, is it more likely that perhaps he made the whole thing up? because there's a history and because he's he's jealous i mean like you know like he tried to remake the grape stomp or sold a bunch of s1s that hurt me on everyone and there weren't even you know so it's like it's a lot of desperation and it's a lot of i mean and see we're talking about an event that happened like 10 years ago yeah it scenario has played out where an individual who has not gotten what he wanted from us who because jeff or i wouldn't see eye to eye with them or or wouldn't you know, degrade our quality or lower our, our moral integrity, they lashed out. And not only do they lash out, but they, they will concoct rumors of, and lies to, you know, to like really discredit us, to um, affect our reputation. And I guess this is what happens when you're really good at what you do or when you're at the top. I don't know, but it's not right. And we are all about truth and anybody who really follows us would know that. And we really want to target those who are discerning enough to be able to tell fact from fiction. And so we have, so we, you know, it's, it's kind of like what we're about is we try to represent highest quality. Those are going to do everything they can to bring us back down. It's like crabs in a barrel or something. Yeah, of course, of course. Just to, to touch on kind of something similarly related to what you just spoke about, you guys said, you, you know, you believe in this idea of like the way you treat your body has like like kind of vibes or um, like frequencies related to it. Something I was interested because we ask a lot of guests about it is what's your thoughts on people who mix tobacco with cannabis? Do you think it's a detriment? Do you think it's like you just don't really care? Where do you stand on that one? I don't do it. I mean, I smoked for 28 years and um, – you know, I know what tobacco did for me. Um, I like the flavor of cannabis as it is. You know, I'm not really, um, 
I'm not really that opinionated about it. I'm not going to say, ooh, gross, with somebody, you know, lights a blunt up, but um, it's it's definitely not for me. We I think we've all know where there's people who die of lung cancer, they don't even smoke. And then there's people who smoke and they don't die of lung cancer and they live long lives. So we can't really make judgments like that. But what, what we don't smoke our weed with tobacco. However, I also think that the tobacco industry, just like today's modern medical and recreational cannabis industry, is not really growing what we, what I would consider something that human beings who are trying to be their best should ever consume. So it's not only is it the energy and the intention, but it's the method and, and the inputs. This is very easy to come to to figure out why people aren't their best, um, and so. It's not some. It's not like the tobacco that most people are using is not the level of tobacco that should even be considered tobacco. So, you know, that's really what Gage is all about: is going back to the root of the problem and the situation. Is you know, the genetics aren't even the same. And what we really want to evaluate is: is cannabis going to go the route of tobacco, uh, where uh, once medicinal herb smokable herb isn't is and could potentially cause long-term effects that aren't in the plant that you know when grown naturally or grown the way it was intended to be grown so those are questions that we sometimes ask and i'm not really here to promote tobacco but i'm not really here to say that it's it's wrong i would just say do your best to find the very highest quality tobacco you can find yeah if you're going to Without any formaldehyde or any in it, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, I, I 100% subscribe to that. There was actually a, a study put out where they looked at people growing heirloom organic tobacco and they showed that lifelong smokers, these guys, like they had like 90% less cancer. So there's 100% something to be said about well-grown tobacco being way better for you. I guess my question is kind of a little more pitched at Michael for this one. Bodhi raised this idea a few interviews back about how we're seeing like blending in um, like concentrates and in like the terp vape pens and whatnot. But we haven't seen that with tobacco and with other like herbs and whatnot you could blend do you think that from a marketing point of view this is an avenue that hasn't been explored and might start to be like kind of explored more in the future are you do you mean uh the blends as in cannabis blended with say basil or spearmint or do you mean yeah yep totally okay um yeah there's no reason why we wouldn't use synergistic uh plant compounds the whole reason why we now sell medicinal or herbal mushrooms and herbs on our website and we also incorporate that into our gardening methods is because we see the you know botanical and the herbal benefits like you can be somebody who only uses cannabis or you can be somebody who uses all of nature's herbs and fungal and microbials to your advantage um, there's, you know, there's so that's, that's leads into our way of living and how we try to get back to nature and we incorporate all the natural healing and all the natural farming protocols together. Um, not leaving and not, not excluding, but not, you know, solely focusing on one aspect. Gage Green started with cannabis, but has been taken in so many different directions through our journey, through self healing and through self, you know, discovery that we've that we've found that we have to use other herbs that daily with a targeted approach, with a true understanding of how it works, and it's profoundly better than just using cannabis alone. So I'm not really, I don't really see Gage Green diving delving too far into vape pens, and uh, but I'm not opposed to combining concentrates and educating people about the uses of everything. Like everybody's trying to combine everything, right? Like the CBD is in everything like orange juice and watermelon and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, really like if you really, really want to self um, heal, then you should learn 
what everything does and have access, um, have that herb, you know, accessible on its own because then you can kind of combine them yourself. And so that's like, those are just some ideas, but we're all about creating formulas and creating mixes, uh, with herbs and cannabis. And that's something that we do for ourselves. So I a hundred percent think that that is the future and the basis of herbal and Ayurvedic, all the natural healing, uh, systems all incorporate the, you know, this entire, the garden that we live in and all the, the barks, the roots, the stems, the leaves, everything. And then nothing is excluded and should be excluded. Of course. And I guess we'll probably touch a bit more on your grow styles in just a second. But I just want to quickly ask first, my buddy, he's been following your posts like mad on the biodome. He's so obsessed with it. And he's like, the mushroom tea, you've got to ask him, what mushrooms should I be growing to put in my teas? Yeah, of course. The, so, so the reason why we started using the mushrooms is because we started using it in our own lives and found profound benefits. You just have, uh, you just have like strength in every step. You have courage in every sentence behind every thought. You have confidence. All this stuff that is almost um, ethereal that you that can be turned into a manifest into reality through the use of these potent herbs that are uh, and mushrooms that have ancient you know histories so you know we take reishi so just to name the the main ones that we utilize that are that have a lot of research behind them um, reishi turkey tail lion's mane chaga cordyceps and i can go into the benefits of each if you like but basically these are the most potent and life-changing mushrooms you can take that aren't psychedelic they work on a more subtle level so you so you become better without you know getting hit all at once and we use them in our plants we use all of them uh and we found increased vigor increased vitality um pathogen resistance uh taste potency especially so it almost creates like a real meditative high so what we what I did was I was like, maybe we should uh, patent this. Well, it turns out there's already a patent on it in Asia. And so we can't patent it. But I did discover it independently. And But then, there, but if you go online and look, um, like you can just search up lion's mane or turkey tail and, and plant growth enhance, enhancer enhancement. And you will find research. And it's for real. And every compound contained in, in these mushrooms has a benefit for plants. It's does, and um, it's really hard for people to believe. And it really, uh, I was like getting haters, and I can't even, you know, I can't even post a, a post recommending people go and get the mushroom extract on any of my Instagram or, or pages. Um, for selling illegal whatever drugs because they're I believe that there's some people that don't want this information out they they um, because it's it's most likely contained in a lot of uh, bottle nutrients and it's partly why these things work so well so it's what we do what I like to do is find missing elements and I like to uh, put them back in my garden and that's partly where this came from and I know that there are other products that are, I guess you could say, like, they don't tell you what's in it that utilize medicinal mushrooms uh, that are on the market for hydroponics or for organic, whatever. But, yeah, these things are all available and we sell them. You can get them uh, yourself and you can make teas with them. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's really an experimental thing. Where can you get them? Uh, we sell them at gggnatural.com. And that's our our brand and our label, uh, our plant and people formulas. There you go. How convenient, guys! You know where to get it. Yeah. Yep. Support support the team <laughs> for sure, my friends. So I got a whole bunch of biodome and growing questions I'd love to ask, but I just want to quickly jump back to kind of the timeline of Gage Green and just kind of try to get them a bit more closer together. So. 
something I noticed personally was that I thought Mendo Montage was awesome, but it seems to not really get a whole lot of discussion compared to, say, Grape Stomper or Mendo Breath, which obviously it went on to be a part of. Right. Do you have any idea as to why that is? Because it, it seems great in my mind. You know why? Um, maybe, maybe it just because... Um, the Mendo Perps was um, has been around in Canada and and Northern California for a long time. So, I I think that before we developed that that you know hybrid Mendo Perp, a lot of people were really looking at like train wrecks and the OGs and and or they would want GDP, uh, or GDP, Urkel. right. Those were marketed. The granddaddy perp was really being heavily, heavily marketed, and uh, that was a very significant Bay Area strain. So there's there's a lot of things. I I just think that the momentum really didn't pick up because maybe it people didn't think it was that different from the other things. But uh, but the Mendo montage, uh, but the Mendo montage really did. Uh, fuse well with and go on like to make the Mendo breath and it, it was a good mail we used the Mendo montage mail that yeah. actually created a lot of crosses you, you know my opinion is it's really unpredictable it's like there's you can always um, you can make hits but the market might not always realize it and they might not know for until you're you've passed or you know I mean this is art like if you study art it's just it's part of how things happen, and um, not every people still today want Grape Stomper, but they don't realize that that was a creation made 12 years ago, and there's new crosses now, and these new crosses incorporate even more champion genetics. Now, why isn't why hasn't say Mesmerizer t- taken off, or why hasn't Focus taken off? There's so many reasons, and there's so many crosses that are being made. And they're all hitters. They're all home run hitters any one of these could be the next whatever but the but because they because there's the i mean i would say the industry is saturated with with you know amazing crosses right now but it's just hard for even the best seeds and best genetics to sometimes be received it has a lot to do with timing it has a lot to do with hype it has a lot to do with who picks it up, who grows it, who's talking about it. And obviously this could be figured out and it's part of, it's part of, you know, how you create new music and how you create new, whatever it's, it's a science at a certain point, but we try to, we try to just create the best work. And I would say that everything we have is on par with grape stomper or Mendo breath. It's just not always, received like that and and it's it like i said it's all timing and the right people have to be in place and that's that's um it's part of the magic i guess of being in the right place at the right time we've uh we've always seemed to been, be able to pull genetics out of the hat um but yeah like my opinion is people sleep and they 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 miss out on really fire crosses just because they're looking for the hype or that name didn't catch or whatever you know what i mean and so those are all potential reasons yeah of course i think that there's so much truth to that that it's it's a mixture of luck and marketing and if people are just aware a question we got which i wanted to ask myself which i think is just a really good one is you guys have mentioned that um lewis armstrong and even more generally speaking jazz has been an influence in your breeding and I'm a huge jazz fan, so that just resonates with me. But more notably, you don't hear other breeders saying this sort of thing. So, what's some of your favorite jazz, and how do you feel that's influenced you guys? Uh, Well, Louis Armstrong was a definite influence, and I think that he was the main influence for the name of Gage Green because um, you have read the bios of Louis um, and some of the other uh, musicians of that golden age. Um, gauge was a term that they used, you know, to, instead of pot or 
weed or grass. It was gauge. And, you know, there were a few others, uh, names, but I just liked the way the, the name sounded. It resonated really well with me. And, um, Louie, I mean, the guy was a lifelong marijuana user, you know, and it was like, he was just so cool and always so happy. And I mean, his, his vibration was always just so incredibly high that everybody loved the guy, you know? I mean, he's, he's something that, you know, we should all aspire to be. And, um, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't really showing off riches or, um, his, you know, he was just like a down earth guy who made his incredible talent look easy. And, um, and I just wanted to, I just wanted that as a part of my company. You know, I just, I just wanted, I mean, he, the guy is a, like a true artist and I come from an art background. I'm, um, um, I have a degree in painting and printmaking. Um, and that's what I've been doing all my life. And so I approach things a little different than a lot of people, I guess. I, I try to meld the, the similarities between, um, a palette of paint and a palette of, um, crosses and a palette of heirlooms and a, you know, just things like that. And I, um, or a palette of experience or a palette of using, uh, utilizing my friend's, uh, work who, you know, is a project who, you know, there's just all kinds of palettes and it's a metaphor, but it's a good metaphor for what we do. Um, so we're painting, we're painting, uh, cannabis pictures, you know, more or less. And to me, that's really healthy because it's a good way to describe, um, the work. You know, you, you, I know you've seen Michael's descriptions of our work. It's, um, the way he describes it's, it's almost like uh, poetry, you know, the smells and the effects and everything. So, um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but, um, that's, that's a lot of people take it like it's a science. We take it like it's an art. Yeah. And that's really the difference. Yeah, of course. And I, I certainly pick up on what you mean and I, I don't think it's, it's ambiguous or anything like that. I think you can, you can totally understand that. So on that topic of influences, you mentioned earlier that Shanti Barber was someone you looked up to, Jeff. I guess this one's for both of you. Are there any other breeders who you consider to be influential to you? Oh, yeah. Jeff has been the most influential breeder to me. I'll be 100%. Uh, well, thank you. Um, you know, I'm just, um, to tell you, my life is just, I'm just a work in progress, to tell you the truth. I'm, you know, I, I learn things all the time. Um, and, as, you know, there are a lot of really good breeders. Um, and, you know, really too numerous for me to mention here. Um, but just, just look at the breeders that he draws his work from. Right. Yeah. So jo- Jojo, and, uh, Shanti Baba, you know, there's a, there's a plethora of them. And if I don't mention you guys, you know, um, no offense, but you know, you, you know, those of you who know you're doing good work, you're on my list, you know? Yeah, a very common sentiment we hear. You don't, you don't want to upset anyone by leaving them out so we won't even go there. <laughs> um, so, the next thing I wanted to chat was, as you might be aware, we had NorCal Mag on the show recently and he gave us his side of the story about how the Mendo collab went down and without getting into any specifics, he basically said that it kind of ended with what he considered you guys defaulting on the deal. Would you be able to give us your side of the story and how that all went down? Sure, Mike can do that. Yeah, I, I could. I could pretty much explain it. I mean, so there was a lot of, I just say, drama and third-party uh, influences, like 
Marcus from Cult Classics really like put the devil in his ear, let's just say, and kind of tore like kind of ruined our relationship with NorCal because well, some people just have that ability. So but there is actually multiple players. So what happened was ultimately like the Mendo breath and the grateful breath were really limited drops. So there was, I mean, it was like a handful of seeds. There was not a lot of money and we all got paid at the, uh, towards the, when did this happen? Around like 2013 or so we had made a, or at the end of 2012, I don't really remember. We made a batch of grateful breath crosses and he, uh, we all knew about it. It was, it was a bigger batch. There was, I would say about 85 packs. And, uh, I mean, it's not a big batch, but grateful breath. I mean, sorry, as we all know, it just doesn't make seeds. So this was like, we put, we, we set aside, you know, space for this. And, um, the, so what happened was we were going to sell, we had a seed bank in, in the, in Europe called bank of gauge. And this guy named skunk monkey who had been working with us for, for years, just starts to get ill that he just can't respond to messages. He's just no longer active like he was. And we never found out what happened. And then, and then, uh, this guy, Ed Borg from, uh, Delta nine, Delta nine reached out and said, uh, reached out to us and wanted to distribute our seats. So we said, okay, well, then there was like this, then he had an assistant named Callum Latimer and Callum decided somehow picked us up. It's like, basically, um, there was, there was some issues with Ed. I'm not sure what exactly what happened. Um, but Callum accused him of ripping him off or something like that. And then, so Callum's like, let me do this. And being naive and, and not exactly knowing how to make the right decision at the time, we said, we said, sure, um, you, you handle the seeds. So he ends up getting the grateful breath, all the seeds, because Skunk Monkey was supposed to drop them and never did. You see, like there's, because we, and so there was a little bit of a rush, I would say. Like we were kind of wanted to see this thing happen. And there was a lot of uh, genetics that Skunk Monkey was holding onto that was just sitting there. And so um, then what happened? Um, Callum, Callum basically him. went and got him, and then he went rogue on us. He basically was like, hey, my friend wants an order, and he's a distributor, and I sell it to him for like you know distributor pricing and blah, 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 and, and I need my royalties on that. And I was like, or a sale commission or whatever. And I was like, no, we don't really want to pick up a distributor. We, we want to sell our own seeds. We don't want to lower our prices. We don't want it everywhere in Europe. We've had bad experiences with that. And so this guy got upset. He was so upset that he claimed that we didn't, you know, we, we weren't paying him or whatever it was. And he decided to steal all the seeds. And wow. uh, we lost, I would say, I mean, I don't even know how to put a value on 85 packs of Grateful Breath, but you know, like we auction seeds off for thousands of dollars. And um, the, and this is like, I mean, our bread and butter, this is how we live. And there was a ton of other seeds um, that were all stolen, all limited, all, you know, we, we relied on. And after that happened, what happened? I will say that I made the mistake of not notifying NorCal. And I would say that the reason my my reason for it was because I was in a state of depression after that happened like seeing somebody that I had trusted and um who had like you know come and helped us at a show and really like basically fooled us cuz it was like hey peace and love brother and it's like dude I don't, I don't want to hear like all about positivity, you know what I mean? But that's all fake when you steal from me. And, and I've, we fell for it. And so this is what, this is, you know, lessons learned, but basically I was really fucked up over it. I was like, man, 
I can't even trust anybody anymore. We just lost a hundred thousand dollars. But um, what are we gonna What are we gonna do? And so I didn't really talk to anybody for a while, and I was just focused on my own and kind of you know I go like into the cave and just just ham just go ham on the plants and and the garden. We I don't really communicate for a while, and so. What ended up happening was I forgot to let NorCal know that this never happened. And so he was like, oh, dude, you never paid me or whatever. And rumors started going around that, like, I never paid NorCal. I was like, no, dude, that's not what happened. Like, we literally didn't make we, – we, we lost everything. And, uh, you know, I, the only thing I can do is give you, you know re- – so I've just been giving him seeds and, like – but the crosses basically that were made under the deal, um, well, like basically the final batch of seeds was never paid for. I never paid him for those because they, they were, we got jacked and that's basically what happened. Um, I know that he probably doesn't, I don't really know if he knows or if he still remembers like that that's what happened. But, um, yeah, that would be my side of the story basically of what happened with grateful breath and why that why he probably doesn't really feel too great about it because there was a whole chunk of change that was supposed to go into his pocket that he never got and um it was it was more or less our fault for you know trusting the wrong people and basically getting royally jacked and so what then ended up happening was this guy named like omerta genetics who is like a Canadian wannabe breeder who just, you know, knock crosses gauge green back and forth like they all do. And um, Omerta goes and visits Callum or Callum goes and visits Omerta in Canada or something. I see this like on social media. I'm like, I know exactly what goes down. And then I get rumors that Omerta is selling great grateful breath seeds to people behind the you know, in, in private and stuff. And so I really, I kind of went off on him and, but it was like, this is late to remedy the situation. We had gotten jacked by the, uh, hundreds of thousands or whatever. And so we're, um, yeah, that's what, that's really what happened. And, uh, it was, it was one of the biggest losses that I've ever suffered and, and seen. And, um, but definitely not the biggest, and uh not the only one and so i will say that this journey you know in through gauge green and through this industry has been very trying at times where we've gotten where we've made and made the wrong decision or trusted the wrong person and have lost a lot and so we're we're really lucky to be alive and to be where we are and to have what we have and so we just kind of keep pushing and trying to do our best but Things do, you know, things do happen, and it, it's unfortunate. Yeah, let me just clarify one thing. Um, the original g- agreement was for the crosses from the OG KB uh, and the o- OG Joe. So the um, and so any of the seeds from that were supposed to be included in our agreement, where we were going to split the profits. <laughs> However, um, nobody had any idea that the Mendo breath was going to be as popular as it was. And I, I kind of have this feeling that that wasn't included in the agreement. But maybe, maybe- – well, I would say that um, – well, like we see we, what happened with the Mendo breath is uh, – well, I would say that uh, what happened with the Mendo breath was that we only made like – there was only like 30 seeds – and the first cross and we never remade Mendo breath, but that would be our agreement with him was all F ones with OGKB. The, uh, Mendo breath, there was only like, I would say, let's just say there was 40 seeds. We split them and we had 20 and we popped some and he popped some. I mean, there was like, there was just a few seeds. This is a very, very early days of just like playing with this OGKB plant. And, uh, he, what was it? Um, well, I all my so there's this guy, one of our workers, um, stole the Mendo breath F1 seeds from my altar. So it's like I don't even have Mendo breath, you know. Like what? This is just a weird thing. Like we don't um, we <laughs> just weird things happen. People are um, 
just always trying to like feed off of us or whatever. So that, that, so we have suffered losses in those ways. And, um, but other than that, like I would say that what, the reason why I brought up uh, cult classics earlier, he's just been a real um, pain in the ass, is that um, what happened was OGKB just freaking dies. Like it has fusarium and root rot issues. And so um, our mom died. Like it was like a four foot tall plant that was like really healthy and we were about to take clones and then like the next day it was wilted. And this is before we, this is kind of like when we were all just learning about what fusarium was. And uh, so it was like, and so we lost the mom. And I was like, hey, this was right after, um, this was before like any, we had any of these issues, like any seeds are lost. And I was like, hey, NorCal, like I lost my um, OGKB cut, like can I get another cut, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, oh, it was like, it was either, I forgot what it was, it was like, no, nah, or like, um, Marcus has it and he and he doesn't want anybody else to have it. I was like, what? And then like Marcus starts running his Instagram. I'm just like, this is getting weird. Like, wait, like what about the uh, making this cross with F1s or whatever? And so like basically, I don't know. He, he It was like Marcus kind of got into his ear, I would say, and basically made him salty about the fact that we were having success with Grateful Breath and – um he shouldn't give us the OGKB to make crosses with or whatever, and they should do it. And he was going to give them like a larger percentage or whatever it was, you know, how people are. And so after that, I was like, we just stopped making OGKB crosses. And it was just, uh, I was like, okay, then that's done. Um, but we still had those grateful breath seeds to sell. And so then that whole thing went down and it was like, okay, well, we it was like just over i was like yeah dude like these seeds are gone and he was uh at that point in a partnership with co classics was just unwilling to you know want to make more crosses or do anything like that which i would say is really where the agreement ended was when he you know wasn't interested in uh, you know sharing the the clone only whatever like See, the truth is, like, everybody has this clone, okay? Like, and we could have gotten it from, like, whatever, four or five different people that I know that have it. The only thing is, I'm like, you know, we work with NorCal, and this is kind of his baby. So I'm not going to go behind his back and get a cut that we really don't need. And it's just it had his time and his place. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of my feelings on the whole situation and, and how it went down. Kind of a bummer because uh, he's a pretty cool guy. Yeah, we didn't we didn't uh, intend for him to be um, upset or feel bad at all. I mean, that's that's the last thing we want with anybody we work with, whether or not we like him. You know, it's not it's not good to have somebody that you're doing business with upset at you for any fucking reason. So, you know, I don't um, I I would rather work something out with him but the fact of the matter is i've met this guy at a couple shows and i've tried to be friendly to him and he has never said anything to me about being upset i just hear it online right right it's like because i have called him many times and been like hey so you know the situation you know like i got your back like what you need what you need like do we you know and it's like We've actually given him our crosses. I think he's just, I think he's just sour, you know, and maybe hasn't really like forgiven us for uh, dropping the ball on that, the drop, you know, like, and shit does happen. And so, you know. Yeah, shit happens. And, you know, we, we didn't intend to make anybody unhappy, but, you know, you can't please everybody. So you just got to please yourself. That's what I say. You know, because, you know, you may try to you may try to do the right thing and you, you know, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. You know, somebody just let's just I I have always um, found that when we do things ourselves, we're 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 way more successful than we when we rely on others and all our failures. And um, every time we've gotten jacked or 
have lost out, you know, or the garden got completely killed. It's always been somebody we trusted to come in and help. And so it's like, it's been, um, it's been ultimately kind of difficult to find and hire and work with the right team because whether it be, this is just like a very delicate, um, business or that there's just a lot to lose or take. It's been very hard to find, um, trustable people and it's a common sentiment, but that has been our most difficult, um, I guess like hurdle in this industry and growing as a, as a, you know, startup or, you know, entrepreneurs is finding people that we can trust because there is so much to at stake. It's, it's almost, um, it, yeah, that's just what I think. Yep. Yeah, totally. I, I, I think that's a really common sentiment we hear from a range of breeders that, collabs are invariably hard to manage over the long term and i think that the context you provided to the collab with norcal really helps to paint a more holistic picture of what actually happened and if there's one thing i can agree on it's like when you were talking about callum with the the peace and love thing after hearing all these stories whenever i meet someone who's like too heavy on the peace and love thing i get a little bit of an alarm bell for that reason right exactly see we're about spirituality and we're about developing the soul there's there's a there's um there's you know the grind not everything is all 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 happy and dandy nope and so like callum was snorting xanax and and all this stuff i don't even want to get into it xanax and bike and uh bike it in and muscle you, relaxants or whatever just like a garbage yeah can. and and this is all we discovered this like way too late and so this is why we are against drugs this is why I'm like, if you ever go to my personal page, like I just don't let people talk shit. I just don't let people get away with little things anymore because I've seen what people are capable of and I'm just not for it anymore. And so, yeah, we do so much though. Yeah, no, I understand. I think the other point people should realize is that you got to be careful if someone's watching your garden. <laughs> right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So, what did you think? It's just starting to get real juicy, isn't it? I guess I'll see you back for part two.